Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this uh, exceptional discussion uh, this, this uh, evening. I must say that uh, this is the middle of exam period. And so every one of you who are here either do not have exams or have your priorities straight. I was just thinking about, um, you know, in my life, if I'd spent one more hour studying for an exam, uh, how much difference did that make in my life, as opposed to a chance to hear some extraordinary person inspire, uh, challenge, whatever, we, I think this is the right choice. So we're very, very pleased to have uh, the Foreign Minister of Norway with us this evening and two other very distinguished guests. Uh, I'm going to, it's what we'll have is the Foreign Minister will speak first and then we'll have two discussants. And so I can't imagine a more important time or a more important topic. Uh, there's a whole set of issues uh, that face um, the uh, set of conversations that we can have around global health. They range from, uh, we've seen everything from pandemics to obviously the health issues in developing nations and many other things in between. And the striking feature is it's a place where unusual uh, alliances, the usual alliances break down, the usual rules aren't always the same, and it gives a real opportunity for the diplomatic side to come together and provide real hope that we can work together on some of the global issues that we all face. So our panelists tonight include um, a fellow dean, uh, Julio Frank. Since 2009, he has been the dean of the Harvard uh, School of Public Health. And he is the uh, Theo and uh, Gianna Angelopoulos Professor of Public Health and International Development at the School of Public Health and at the Harvard Kennedy School. Now, I believe he is not only the only dean in this situation, I'm not sure there's ever been a dean who is also a member of the faculty of another uh, a panel, at least a member that actually he says, he, my dean. So uh, this is an interesting uh, challenge for me, but we're just thrilled that Julio was, is here a part of it. Well, he has a very, very distinguished record. Uh, he was the Minister of Health in New Mexico from 2000 uh, to 2006. He pursued a very ambitious uh, reform agenda to reform the nation's health system, especially in terms of social equality. He's probably best known for introducing a program which really created comprehensive national health insurance, uh, which uh, it seems like he's been more successful than we have in this country. Uh, it was known as Seguro Popular, uh, and it really did cover mil tens of millions of Mexicans who had not previously been insured. He's the founding director of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. Um, he was, in 1998, the uh, executive director in charge of evidence and information policy at the WHO. Uh, and he was in charge of their first ever uh, group explicitly charged with developing a scientific foundation for health policy. Um, there are many, many other uh, awards and things that, to remark upon. Um, one of the things I admire about him, besides his various involvements with uh, critical institutions around the world, uh, is that he's also written best-selling novels for children, uh, explaining the functions of the human body. Now, I've actually not seen these novels, and I hope that they are uh, suitably appropriate for children, and that accounts for their best-selling nature. Um, in September 2008, he received the Clinton Global Citizen Award for changing, quote, the way practitioners and policymakers across the world think about health. Next, we have Sue Goldie, who is the Roger Irving Lee Professor of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management, and she's also the director of the Center for Health Decision Science in the Harvard School of Public Health. Her work spans a really wide range of activities, uh, based on um, uh, program development to um, evidence-based analysis to inform very difficult uh, policy decisions. Um, probably the most important thing one needs to know in terms of her pedigree is that she's been a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Awards uh, most recently. I guess she got it in 2005. This is something that um, all of us uh, secretly aspire to, though none of us admit to it. Um, that plus a Nobel Prize, which I'm sure the minister is very instrumental in, uh, in helping to uh, engage. She, uh, she's, she's worked in a variety of settings, ranging from uh, disparities across race and gender and socioeconomic focus. Um, and uh, she's also been working in the last few years on, on analytic models that are, uh, uh, her analytic energies have been focused on the prevention of maternal 
mortality in low and middle income countries such as India, Mexico, uh, Nigeria, and the like. Um, she's received numerous teaching and mentorship awards, uh, including the Harvard School Public Health Mentorship Award and other things of that sort. And finally, she's served co-director as of the executive committee of the Harvard Institute for Global Health for the last two years. Finally, um, I want to introduce our, our primary speaker, uh, Jonas Karstora, who is the foreign minister of Norway. Um, he will discuss the confluence of health and foreign policy. Minister Stura has, been, has served as Norway's foreign minister since 2005, um, and he was previously secretary general of the Norwegian Red Cross. Prior to that, he served as secretary of state and chief of staff in Prime Minister Stoltenberg's first government, um, and he previously served as chief of staff of the World, Organ World Health Organization under Gro Harlem uh, Brundtland. Minister Stura has held various senior positions in the Norwegian government, including the Director General of the International Development of the Off International Department of the Office of the Prime Minister and Senior Advisor of the Prime Minister. And he's a former lecturer at Harvard Law School, so we claim him as one of our own. He holds degrees from Sciences Po and attended Naval Officers Training uh, School at the Royal Norwegian uh, Naval Academy. I visited his beautiful country uh, this summer. If you have not been to Norway, uh, I strongly recommend it. I uh, am fond of saying, I love Maine, as some of you will know. It's just like Maine, except they have mountains that come down to the ocean. They have beautiful fjords. It's, it's light 24 hours a day in the summer, and the food is better. But otherwise, it's just like Maine. So <laughs> with that um, unusual introduction, let me turn to someone who brings remarkable talents of both diplomacy and intellect to a very, very important uh, set of issues. Um, the Foreign Minister of Norway, uh, Minister Stora. Well, thank you, Dean Elwood, for those very nice words. I, will, I hope I will not ruin Norway's reputation with my lecture. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being so many. I, it's a great honor for me to be here. And to Julio, I will have to share uh, with the audience, I think, um, what happened when I visited Harvard back in June 1998. I was then the uh, leader of Dr. Brundtland's transition team, preparing her coming as um, Director General to WHO. And I came here to Harvard to attend a seminar organized by Chris Murray and Jeffrey Sachs on the importance of investing in health to combat poverty. Julio was one of the speakers. I stayed here for 24 hours, and when I left Harvard, I had recruited Julio to Dr. Brundtland's senior management team <laughs> to head the historic evidence and information for policy cluster. I had recruited Chris Murray to become his right hand, and ultimately his successor, and I had halfway recruited Jeff Sachs to chair the upcoming Commission on Macroeconomics and Health. Not bad for 24 hours. I am pretty proud about that. This time, however, the purpose is not recruitment, but sharing ideas and dialogue on global public health challenges. And a bit on where I come from, I'm not a public health person. When I came to WHO, I said that I would try to learn as much as possible about, about health without being a medical person. Uh, I have experienced and learned how health challenges, health threats, and health opportunities matter far beyond health. And I've learned how it matters even into the field of security and foreign policy. In short, that the interdependence created by health perhaps is one of the most striking features of globalization. Many decision makers, however, and this I have found, act as if health issues are secondary concerns in foreign policy. As if global health is a kind of nice to solve issue that we can tackle gradually when times are good as if paying for health is more an expenditure than an investment. So all of that has kind of led me to the conviction that we need to build a far greater awareness of the interconnectedness of health concerns and other areas of politics, including that of my own foreign policy. And this is my main point today that I'd like to elaborate on, and I would like to make three main arguments. First, why foreign policy decision-making must and should incorporate the notion of health. Second, why health practitioners on their side and policymakers should understand that engaging in foreign policy 
is a necessary part of solving some of the most pressing health challenges that we face. And third, why we need to build a variety of ideas, institutions and initiatives that will help promote this interconnectedness and the global response to health issues. So I'll start with the first point, the relevance of health for foreign policy. As I mentioned, there are those who see health issues without any real impact on so-called high, hardcore politics. And they see solving these issues more as an act of charity, a nice-to-do thing, a humanitarian matter. <coughs> I believe this view is profoundly out of sync with the reality of today's emerging globalized world. In many ways, protecting and enhancing the health of its population is the most important goal for any government. And I happen to believe that the goal of foreign policy is to make domestic policy possible. So in that link, uh, we see a direct connection. Too many foreign, too many foreign policy uh, decision makers overlook that global conditions outside the boundaries of the nation state have a defining effect on national health, and in the worst of cases, an effect on national security. When the mad cow disease ravaged Western Europe. I was in the Prime Minister's office 10 years ago. Then state closed borders. Norway closed its border on Sweden. That's Europe's longest land border, by the way, on all trade with Sweden. And we then made the experience that closing a border is easy. Opening it up again is very difficult. Because when are you safe enough to open? And what kind of accusation do you assume on the other part when you close it? And how do you calm down your population when you open? Even with Swedes, you have to, t to make that reflection. <laughs> when the pandemic flu spread last year, similar reactions occurred. The opening and closing of borders, again, is no small deal in today's interconnected world. I also remember, and as I, I guess Julio will do, the SARS outbreak in 2002. Dr. Brunton was at WHO. I was not at her side, but in close communication with her. Spanning several months, it spread through 25 countries. It severely disrupted travel, trade, and workplace. And some estimates placed the cost for the Asia-Pacific region alone at $40 billion. It created an enormous health policy challenge for individual countries, and it created political, political pressures at the highest level. There were travel restrictions issued by WHO on Hong Kong. But when Dr. Brundtland issued travel restrictions on Toronto, it became a different matter. Because how could you really impose that on a country like Canada? Well, evidence told her that she should do it, but it immediately became an issue of high, high politics. So far, we have luckily avoided a full-blown pandemic. The cost and challenge of, of such a pandemic, Spanish flu back in 1918, would be much worse than the SARS and the H1N1 outbreak combined. In 2008, the World Bank estimated that the flu pandemic could kill 17 million people worldwide, cost 3 trillion, and result in a nearly 5% drop in world gross domestic product. These are speculations, of course, but just think about the figures and the political consequences. Are we, as foreign policymakers, prepared, scenario-wise, thinking through what that would mean in terms of security? A simple universal lesson emerges from these lessons and numbers, that national borders offer little protection against health, virus, health risks, that national interest and national economy are dependent on global conditions of health, and therefore on the ability of foreign policy to influence these conditions and deal with them if they blow into a crisis. In sum, health issues are not peripheral concerns in foreign policy and national interests. Increasingly, developed countries have understood that they need to adopt a perspective of what I'd like to call enlightened self-interest. Helping developing countries to progress economically, creating conditions of global fair trade and encouraging respect for universal human rights are valuable goals, important goals, necessary goals, just and good in themselves. What is sometimes forgotten, however, is that healthy population is an essential component for the success of policies designed to address these conditions. Many policymakers agree that poverty may be a source of conflict, violence and even terror. But then, in order to take this into its logical conclusion, they should take a keener interest in what it takes to combat poverty for reasons of human dignity, but also 
for national security reasons. I, I was struck when I was at WHO to learn that the CIA uses the Child Mortality Index to evaluate if a state is moving towards failure. How can you measure that the state is about to become a failing state? Well, this is the best index. High figures give the best indication of an emerging failing state. And this connection, I believe, is indeed valid, but precisely for that reason, security pundits should take an interest in what it may take to change the trend shown by the index. Because if a high index is a security threat, how can we get that index down? This, in fact, is what the world is doing by pursuing the Millennium Development Goals, which I think is one important step in bringing this knowledge out. And I think, you know, in modesty, Julio, that what we did on the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health brought that evidence out to new sectors uh, of society. The global strategy, the NDD strategy, agreed by world leaders, aimed at halving the number of people living in absolute poverty by 2015. It is no coincidence that three out of the eight goals are related to health. Many policy decision makers and economists assume that economic development alone will improve the health conditions of developing countries. In general, it will have a positive effect, of course. But the Sachs Commission report of 2000 provided clear evidence that economic growth is not in itself sufficient. The report concluded, and I recommend reading it again because it is good reading, that targeted and specific health-oriented initiatives, as well as tied funding, are required to improve the health conditions of poor countries. It also concluded that doing so will have a multiplier effect on the impact of economic development policies. The AIDS pandemic in Africa is perhaps the most striking example of how failing to address health conditions can have massive costs on foreign policy goals. The pandemic woke up the world to acknowledge the broader consequences. The tragedy in the fact that entire swaths of the productive workforce, the police, doctors, teachers, civil servants, and business people, they were disappearing, dying, turning children into orphans, and weakening the human capital backbone of society. The political consequences of such a pandemic are clear. Development policies and foreign aid cannot succeed if the public and private labor force isn't healthy enough to benefit from it. And we should learn the consequences. So yes, foreign policy decision makers should care much more about health. But let me reverse the argument too. More people on the healthcare side also need to engage foreign policy decision makers. All too often, it is as if health workers shield themselves from other schools of profession and academic thought. I think the health community is the most closed professional community there is. And if somebody you see that as a challenge, please respond to me. We need more of that interaction. And this is the core of the second point I mentioned in my introduction. Engaging in foreign policy is a necessary part of solving some of the most pressing global health goals, goals facing us. My ambition is to use my time as foreign minister to forge new complementarities to the benefit of both global health and global security. Let me expand my point with the help of five concrete observations of this foreign policy health nexus. One. States are key players in creating the demand that is necessary to motivate medical research and production essential to health improvements. It is doubtful, for example, that much progress would have been made on combating AIDS in Africa and beyond if Kofi Annan, the Secretary, UN Secretary General at the time, and governments such as the American government had not worked so hard alongside WHO to establish the Global Fund to fight AIDS TB and malaria, or taking the campaigns for immunization. Thanks to major efforts by UNICEF and WHO back in the 80s, global access to vaccines brought coverage from a level of under 20% to 80% by 1990, but then it stalled at that level. By the late 1990s, a new coalition of stakeholders from the UN, the World Bank, the pharmaceutical industries, to the philanthropy represented by Bill Gates, joined to launch a new mobilization for vaccination and immunization. This coalition needed a government to manifest the dedication of nation states. Norway decided to seize this opportunity. We engaged and invested substantially in Gavi, the global alliance for vaccines and immunization from the very beginning in 2000. 
Gavi is traditional and modern at the same time. Traditional because it is indeed a mechanism to mobilize donor funds. But it is also modern, extremely modern and innovative in the way it disburses resources through a performance-driven system that can measure real progress and create lasting incentives for improving the health system. In short, government intervention is required to compensate for what I would call global market failure. The market is important to drive innovation and helps demand meet supply. But this is far from enough to give hundreds of millions of people, poor people, access to essential medicines and drugs. So in fact, the fact that hundreds of millions do not have the purchase power, and that is a kind of a disappearing of, of, of the market, to me that is market failure. And we have different mechanisms of dealing with market failure, and we should be dealing with it. Second point, the growth of global labor market has important indirect impacts on health in developing nations. And I know the, the, the public school, School of Public Health has worked on that here at Harvard. Many developed countries recruit healthcare workers from developing countries. This may be a good thing both for host countries and for healthcare professionals. But one unfortunate effect is that it drains developing nations of important human capital of their health system. I don't know if it's true, but it's being told that there are more nurses from Malawi in Manchester than in Malawi. That's an illustration of the phenomenon. Given the demographics of an aging Western population and labor shortages in certain sectors, the situation is likely to become even more acute. The international community will have to resolve the ethical and policy issues raised by this development. Now, this is not an issue for health professionals or foreign policy professionals alone, but it is one of those issues which has to be dealt with cross-sector by policymakers if we are going to make a difference. Three, internal and intrastate violence and war is, of course, one of the most concrete threats to a population's health. Combat deaths are only the most obvious cost, but it's estimated that for every soldier killed, 10 or more civilians die and many more are injured and wounded. Moreover, conflicts have devastating effects on healthcare systems. We also know, and this is the 10th anniversary for UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women and conflict, conflict-related sexual violence has affected hundreds of thousands of women over the last decades and has had serious consequences for peace, stability, and reconciliation efforts. This, too, has a very strong health dimension. Before the civil war in Liberia, there were 237 doctors in that country. When peace was declared in 2003, only 23 remained. That's why addressing civil and interstate violence, a key dom domain for foreign policy, is a crucial health-promoting activity. It could be more effective if foreign policy decision makers understood this better and earlier. Norway led, for its part, the effort to negotiate a treaty to ban cluster munitions, a type of weapons with unacceptable humanitarian consequences. The treaty was signed in Oslo two years ago. It was a real piece of hard foreign policy negotiations. But the effort, I have thought in the aftermath, like any other disarmament effort, could equally be characterized as a foreign policy-driven effort with clear public health yields. Fourth point, many important health threats must be met by means far beyond the health sector's domain. Take the tide of chronic diseases or lifestyle diseases now hitting most countries, north and south. Facing these challenges also means confronting powerful economic interests, such as the tobacco industry, as the WHO did under Dr. Brundtland's leadership. But it is only one example of how to meet that tide of chronic diseases will have to mobilize the whole sectors, whole sectors of policy uh, uh, making in government beyond health, if any preventive strategies are going to succeed. Five, the probable impact of global climate change on health conditions. Many of the most dangerous infectious diseases are highly sensitive to climate conditions. Global warming will allow them to expand their range and intensity. This means that many countries with the least resources will face an intensified challenge anew, including a new tide of refugees. As a result, international support and cooperation will become even more so important. 
let's hope negotiators in Cancun these days will bring this perspective with them. So, having made the case for several links between health and foreign policy, where does this leave us? What more can we do? Few reflections on this. First, we need better advocacy on the interconnectedness of health and foreign policy. Dr. Brundtland at WHO made the point that her problem was not so much to deal with health ministers. They understood why health mattered. Her and our mission back then was rather to convince presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers and foreign ministers that they too are health ministers, perhaps with more influence on health decisions in their governments. I think the striking fact was to observe that when you came to Africa, you could find that the health minister was not even sitting at the cabinet table. It was a kind of a second-rank minister. Whereas I've experienced in Norwegian government that being a health minister, you are exposed on first rank. You win and lose elections on the basis of performance. Together, professions should come together and develop evidence and language that help decision makers understand this point and the relevance. We need to continually underline by arguments, experience and research the foreign policy implications of health security globally. We can demonstrate that investing in health is more than a cost. If well managed, it has a return on investment in both money and human value many times over. Let me counter one concern from the health community, which would be to say that our oath tells us to stay out of politics. And as a former Secretary General of the Red Cross, I know what that is all about. About the humanitarian space, about, you know, uh, helping either friend or foe, you help the victim. My argument in favor of strengthening the links between foreign policy and health is not an argument of mobilizing health for a specific foreign policy. It is about enlightening the reflection on foreign policy to broader sectors of society to understand the implications and how our decisions matter and could be improved. And my second point is therefore to build for support for political initiatives that promote an interconnected global response to health issues. I have mentioned the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and the review process that we have just completed. The effort, although not perfect, has made a huge difference. The recent G8 commitment to focus on child and maternal health is another splendid example as is the UN Secretary General's global strategy for women's and children's health, which has mobilized pledges of almost $40 billion. Friends, this would not have happened by the advocacy of health ministers alone. It is because presidents and prime ministers and ministers of finance and foreign ministers have come out in favor of that argument. We can also work as individual states or in a smaller group of states to promote such efforts. My prime minister, Jens Stoltenberg, his work on MDG 4 and 5 is a great example, as is President Obama's Global Health Initiative. Today, we see major advances in our combined efforts to address the spread of communicable diseases. Much more needs to be done, however, to mobilize against the slow tide of lifestyle diseases that will kill millions and drain state budgets in the years to come. We know it's happening, but we're not mobilizing coherently, only sector by sector, and that's why we stand a poorer chance to succeed. Third, all of the many initiatives taken inside and outside the UN family will require a closer look at the institutional global health architecture. We need to look anew at the global health architecture, global health governance. When we did Gavi and the Global Fund, let's, let's agree, we really blew the UN system. But that was a price worth paying to mobilize the funds. Because if we hadn't done it, all the initiative would have landed outside the UN. That, I believe, would have been a bad thing. At least we have secured that the UN is in, that the World Bank institution is in, in a coherent fashion. But we don't yet have a clear view of what that architecture looks like. I think that really merits a lot of attention. And again, here we will need the link between School of Public Health, School of Government, and... The, also the economic uh, uh, side of the equation. Fourth, we need to engage, each separately. When I became foreign minister five years ago, I reached out to a carefully selected set of colleagues. From Brazil, 
France, Indonesia, Senegal, South Africa and Thailand. Countries representing a real variety in terms of experiences. And we met at the margins of the UN General Assembly to create the Foreign Policy and Global Health Initiative. In March 2007, we met again in Oslo to adopt the Oslo Declaration and Action Plan on Global Health. It identified 10 key policy areas where we believe the international community needed to better understand the health implications of foreign policy. This initiative continues to grow in strength, Expert meet, experts meeting regularly, informing the ministers. At expert level, the group is now chaired by Brazil. Later this week, at the UN General Assembly, there will be an adoption of an annual foreign policy and global health resolution co-sponsored by a great number of countries, including three important newcomers, the United States, China and India. And finally, and this is my last point, we need more knowledge and better evidence. What we need now is an interconnected model of research that can create the evidence base and help support our efforts. We need events like this, where foreign policy researchers, public health analysts, decision makers, and medical practitioners come together to jointly discuss these challenges and possible solutions. We need to reach out to a new generation of researchers and policy planners and integrate these perspectives into their worldview from the outset and not at some hopeless late stage in the career like me. <laughs> I'm happy to announce today that Norway and the Foreign Policy Health Initiative will be supporting a new collaborative uh, research project involving Harvard and fine institutions in Norway, South Africa, Brazil and Indonesia. A collaborative project seeking to better understand the impact of various foreign policy domains on health and what methods we should use to promote health, global health solutions in international politics. We are also exploring the possibility of supporting a joint Lancet and University of Oslo Commission and with Harvard on global governance for health as a way of further promoting cross-disciplinary research and exchange. So these are some, I believe, promising steps, and I am proud to have played a small role in them. But to be honest, and this was the point I just made, nothing could make me happier if one of the younger students would be able to stand here, let's say, in 20, 25 years, and tell the next generation of policymakers and health practitioners that the achievements of that gen generation had far eclipsed those of my own in seeing the interconnectedness between sectors of policymaking of governments, of evidence and science that this interconnected world so badly needs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Foreign Minister. Dean Frank. <coughs> uh, good evening to everyone. First of all, I want to thank uh, my Dean, <laughs> David Elwood, for the, for hosting this uh, extraordinary exchange and the opportunity to engage in a conversation with Jonas Story, who is really a, very much an admired friend of a long time and, uh, as you heard, former colleague at, at WHO. Uh, and his um, really enlightened speech illustrates what I believe is the hallmark of a new era in global health. I mean, as we are drawing to the close of the first decade of the 21st century, it only has, you know, a few more days to go. We, we have witnessed in this decade, I think, the birth of a new era in global health. And to me, the crucial aspect of that is that health has stopped being the sole concern of domain experts, people like myself, people who study health, and has become a key component of the major topics in the global agenda. And this, I believe, is one of the most fundamental legacies of another great Norwegian that I've been privileged to know Gru Harlem Brundtland, uh, during her five years as Director General of WHO. She really managed to take health out of the constraints of domain experts and project it as a key element in the agenda for economic development, for global and national security, for democratic governance, and for the uh, rule of human rights as a fundamental guiding principle. Um, and of course, as you heard, uh, Jonas Tore, as the chief of staff, 
had a, a major role to play in this development. Uh, the consequences of that shift, this uh, new year in global health, have been outstanding. In this decade, you know, in, uh, financial flows for global health almost tripled. I mean, year 2000, they were a little bit under $11 billion a year. Uh, we are now getting close to about $30 billion a year in international flows for global health. Uh, a big part of this was the burst of energy and imagination in developing new forms of organization. Uh, Bill Clark here and I have talked how the, 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 this explosion of, of imagination is uh, the envy of other sectors of, of global governance because we have come up with highly imaginative forms of mobilizing resources, starting with Gavi, another great initiative that Norway has uh, really been uh, the, the, the driving force behind it. And now, you know, with the Global Fund, which has just finished a successful, I think relatively successful replenishment, with now uh, a portfolio of close to $12 billion annually. I mean, numbers that those of us who have been engaged in global health for many, many years would have never dreamed of. Uh, the, the extent, the political visibility of health matters, the uh, level of investment. I mean, this is, there's still m many, many needs that still go unmet and we are very far from having, from being at the level of investment that, that the world should see. But the growth is an, one of these few areas where actually political will has been reflected in resource allocations. And then these new forms of organizing international collective action. So all of that, I think, flows from this idea of making exactly the case that the minister's story just, just made to us. Showing this interconnection that health is not just, health of course has a huge technical and scientific core, but it touches every fundamental aspect. Uh, and although you know, my ethical framework as a physician is that health is inherently valued, that is no, in no way a contradiction to say that in addition to its intrinsic value, health also has an instrumental value as a key force to promote economic development with a fair distribution of the, of the fruits of that development. It's a fundamental aspect of assuring the security of individuals and of nations and of the planet as a whole. And it is one of the arena where some of the key questions regarding the uh, protection and promotion of human rights get played out. Uh, but in a sense, we have been victims of our own success. And I think uh, Minister Story illustrated that when he calls for rethinking the international architecture. Let me just say a few things about that since uh, next January, the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard School of Public Health will be offering a jointly a, a course on uh, global health governance. And this is a small piece of advertising for anyone who has not just uh, registered. Um, uh, Swery Moon, uh, uh, a graduate of the Kennedy School and myself, will be teaching this course as of January. But uh, we have been victims of our own success because what we now have is this enormous constellation, about 120 partnerships, uh, alliances, and programs of all kinds, some huge like the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, or the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, some small and modest. But there's been this explosion of, of new entities, and one gets the impression that uh, they are acting in a space with little coordination and, and, and ex extreme duplication. And it's not just that we like some aesthetic bureaucratic design at the global level. It's the fact that many of these entities operate at country level and are generating a multiplicity of demands on scarce resources. Uh, there's the, you know, the, the multiplicity of reporting requirements, of taking care of delegations coming from all of these new multilateral entities and from the bilateral agencies. Uh, <clears throat> I think the United States discovered the value of health as a, diplomas, a diplomatic tool with PEPFAR, with the President's Emergency Programs for AIDS in, in Africa, uh, which uh, really became I think probably the most valuable legacy of uh, the previous uh, 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 administration in the United States and, and just portrayed how uh, uh, health can be a central element of uh, foreign policy. Uh, but we have now this 
constellation of multilateral entities plus the bilateral agencies descending on countries trying to apply this expanding set of resources in a space that's really uh, uh, not conducive to the best possible uh, action. To my mind, um, the question of uh, global governance is going to require what I think solving three paradoxes. Uh, the first is what I would call the sovereignty paradox. Uh, the sovereignty paradox basically says that in a world where the fundamental political unit is still sovereign nation states, I mean, we're not seeing the disappearings of sovereign, sovereign nation states. This is the organizing principle of the world polity. Health is still fundamentally a national responsibility. When I was Minister of Health in Mexico, I was responsible for anything that happened, and if someone had died of SARS, my head probably would have been chopped, and I couldn't invoke the forces of globalization. This is a national priority. The paradox emerges because increasingly, the determinants of health and the means to deal with health issues are beyond the control of any single nation. No nation alone, not even the most powerful nations, can deal with all the determinants and mobilize all the tools we have to improve the health of populations. What is the solution to the sovereignty paradox? It's not to give up sovereignty. That's not going to happen. Uh, it is to share sovereignty. That's why we have multilateral agencies. They are our vehicle for sharing sovereignty, illustrating uh, the, the, the notion of health as a shared so social objective. The second paradox is what I would call the dissonance paradox. Talking about health systems has become very, very uh, popular. It's an emerging topic. And yet the same agencies that are promoting uh, and trying to provide technical assistance to national governments to put their own health systems in place have been unable to evolve a global health system, a more uh, organized set of relationships among this multiplicity of, of, of actors. To my mind, the, uh, this dissonance can only be solved if we have clarity about the fundamental functions that need to be carried out in, uh, uh, through international action. And to my mind, there's three fundamental functions. The first one is the production of public goods. Knowledge and evidence is you know, the quintessential public good, a good that benefits every nation around the world. We need collective action because otherwise there's no incentive for single uh, countries to produce those public goods that will benefit everyone. Second function is to the management of externalities, when the actions of one government affect the others. And that can be you know, lack of epidemiologic transparency and failure to act uh, uh, to report an outbreak, but it can also be on the positive side, the coordination of action to achieve such amazing goals as having eradicated smallpox and being close to eradicating poliomyelitis. You need to handle externalities both in the negative side and in the positive side. That's a second reason for international action. That's why we need global governance in health. The third function is the mobilization of global solidarity, whether it's through technical assistance, through development uh, financing, or through humanitarian aid. Um, but those three functions, production of global public goods, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the management of externalities, and the mobilization of global solidarity, I think, are the, are the key functions. One of the worrisome signs of this burst of energy and funding for global health is that most of it has focused on the third of these functions, something very important, but we are forgetting particularly uh, uh, we're seeing an erosion of the core functions of producing global public goods. My favorite example is that for a topic that's so culturally sensitive as the question of death and disease, it is truly an amazing feat that every country in the world classifies diseases in exactly the same way. Yet the international classification of disease is not the glamorous part of global health. You know, I'd like to see Bono, you know, give a concert to support and to uh, adopt the, the question of the international classification of disease. Yet nothing that we do would work if we didn't have the international classification of disease. And we have the real risk that while, you know, we're expanding specific, particularly disease-oriented vertical programs, we can see an erosion of the financing, the public financing that's required through the assessed contributions especially to WHO, of these core 
normative functions whose role is to produce um, these public goods or to manage the externalities, like in the recent outbreaks and, and having that coordination. So that's the second paradox. It's a clear analysis of the, of, of the uh, functions. And then having a rational division of labor, not in a neat organizational form, but something that would allow us to make sure that where there are un undue duplications, we correct them, and where, there n when, where we see gaps, we can fill them. And then the third and final paradox is the accountability paradox. Because there's no global government, uh, most of the a a entities that d d operate in this space are accountable to governments. Yet very often those governments are, when they are chronically fail or frail governments, are incapable of meeting the needs of its own populations, or very often the governments are the main perpetrators of fundamental rights of people related to health. To me, the solution to the uh, accountability paradox is to fully embrace the notion of uh, social rights and build a concept of global citizenship that's centered around the uh, social rights, including, of course, the right to health. National citizenship was built fundamentally around civil and political rights and then extended to social rights. Global citizenship has to start and will start with social rights, including the right to health as a key component of making ourselves accountable to people, not to individual governments and creating a, a space so that when governments fail or active, fail to enforce or actively violate rights, there is some way of holding ourselves accountable. I think <clears throat> if we do that, then we will see exactly the realization of what Jonas has called for, a, a, a placing health as a fundamental topic of uh, uh, foreign policy. And in the end, I think uh, what his brilliant lecture has called for is to stop seeing health as a specialized sector of public administration and rather think of health as a fundamental social objective where we need to mobilize every tool of policy, including foreign policy, in order to advance the way we pursue that shared social objective. Thank you, Julio. <coughs> In just a minute, we're going to go to the audience for questions. So think about your questions. There are microphones at these four locations. So uh, as soon as uh, we uh, are ready, we'll, we'll turn to all of you. But next, I want to turn to Professor Sue Goldie. So um, I'm going to keep my comments very brief to maximize our interactive time. But um, I was asked to just comment based on what you just heard on the particular role of universities. And uh, I think what I'll, I'll take the liberty of doing is not only um, to articulate what the roles of a university are, and I'll just highlight a few examples, but also I would arguably say the responsibilities, um, especially as we look forward. So I think of five things. Um, one is to really uh, almost institutionalize an expanded definition, conceptual foundation of global health. So if we talk about a global health agenda and the problems, we're not only talking about uh, infectious disease, maternal child health, malnutrition, but we're thinking strategically about the demographic and the epidemiologic transition, the rising burden which has superseded infectious disease of chronic diseases, um, mental illness, injuries, and then that third big category which are really the global transfer of risk. So all of the things that were already alluded to, but that make this world so different and require that the solutions and the policy responses will also need to be different. Unless we embrace that very large view, then I think our ability to ask the right questions and set the right agendas to come up with solutions that will be durable will be limited. So that's number one. Number two is what we all do, right? The business of universities is producing knowledge. Um, so I won't belabor that piece, but I'll make just a couple of points um, that are particularly, I think, relevant to the next 10, 20 years. So one is that universities, especially Harvard as one example, is our, we're uniquely positioned to be able to leverage all the cutting edge advances. So whether those are in engineering 
or they're in biomedicine, uh, or they're in politics. Um, we have the ability to capitalize on pockets of expertise across domains. So we think about solving problems that require a multi-sectoral response and multi multiple disciplines. A university is a natural hub with which we can, we can leverage those, um, those areas. Second, we have a responsibility to, uh, to step back, and I'm, I'm probably not using this term in the right way, but kind of correct the market forces um, and ask the right questions. So what I mean by that is incentivizing research that matters. So anyone here that works in a soft money institution knows that it's a little bit of a game. The questions we ask are the questions we think that can get funded, whether that's relevant to an NIH, or it's relevant to foundations who have their set of goals, or if it's relevant to alliances that have particular objectives and goals. If we stepped back and said there were no constraints, would we be asking and working and trying to solve the same questions? Um, and I think universities have a role to take a much harder look at that piece and to incentivize, to actually go out of their way to enable students, young junior faculty, um, medium junior faculty, to pursue those most important questions. The third comment is, it's not enough to produce the knowledge. And you've heard about that already in a few different ways today, but we need to translate it. And so that means lots of things to all of you, but let me tell you what we're very bad at. You know, we're not great at even translating what we do to uh, other academics that work in other disciplines. Um, we're even worse at anticipating who the relevant stakeholders are outside of our particular domains and across sectors. And the third piece is that we haven't really established a, a discipline, um, a set of uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes that reflect the field of how we most appropriately and best translate that knowledge to be put into evidence-based policies or whatever other types of global public goods we're trying to um, make a difference with. So that piece, too, is a rich opportunity for universities. Um, the fourth uh, piece is not surprising. It's education. And um, President Faust uh, said something in her inauguration, and I don't even remember the whole sentence, but a piece of the sentence said something like, universities are particularly accountable to the future. And that has rung with me since I heard it. And I think when we think about education, it's not just enhancing our educational curriculum with global health courses. It's really stepping back and thinking about what does an individual, from an undergraduate to a graduate student that is in the sciences or in politics or in any other domain, all the way to a health professional, need to know to be armed to make a difference that's different than 10 years ago. That, so that when we're looking ahead in 10 and 20 years, that generation is not struggling to break boundaries down. It's inherent in their culture that they work across sectors to come up with solutions. And I think that is a primary function of a university. And the final one, um, and I, I will, in full disclosure, say that I have some personal attachment to this one, is we need to create spaces within universities to facilitate all that happening. Um, the forces are against some of it, but if there are spaces, whether it be an institute, whether it be particular centers that bring people together, that lower the boundary of collaboration, those particular hubs and spaces can allow us to think differently, to try to take a neutral stance when we're evaluating what the, the problems and real solutions are and most important questions to address, and it also provides a way for us to think about the nature of our relationships and how we connect not only with each other, but with other institutions, with other sectors, with other countries, um, and with other organizations. And really, within that paradigm is the only way I think we're going to be able to come together to make, um, to make a true difference. So I'll end with that. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we now are going to open up for questions. Let me just tell you the ground rules for questions here at the Kennedy School. A good question has three characteristics. Uh, one, you start by identifying yourself. 
Second, it is short, containing but one thought. And third, it ends with a question mark. <laughs> uh, and so uh, with that, uh, please come to the microphones. There's someone right up there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Farah Mateen. I'm a neurologist and a fellow at Johns Hopkins. I just wanted to bring up the uh, current situation in Haiti with the estimation of 650,000 deaths due to cholera. And uh, to me, it's a good example of um, sufficient evidence and how um, enthusiasm maybe isn't enough and how sort of global exuberance really needs a trajectory. I know a lot of personnel, a lot of funding has been put into uh, the situation, but it's still, in some ways, it's a little bit sobering in my mind. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, I, I thought about when I saw those figures yesterday, I need to go back and work on my speech again, because this is an, you know, yet another illustration. Uh, this is you know, a, a, like a kind of a weather forecast which is pretty certain. We know this is, it is there, the potential is there is going to happen. And it's going to hit the Haitians, but it's also going to threaten all those people who are there, NGOs, uh, relief workers, UN, and all the rest of it. Um, I know there is a quite substantial mobilization going on, uh, led by the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Norway, who is, as a state, contributing uh, substantially to that operation will increase our contribution. But the point comes back, it comes back to the point, do we take into account what it means to run the rescue operation in Haiti after the earthquake, which is now months back, when we all of a sudden come to this crossroads of cholera? And the answer is no, not sufficiently. And here I think it comes back to the point that the military planners, the relief planners, the, the humanitarian planners, have not internalized what it would mean to, to hit that brick road. And uh, I mean, as dramatic as that will be, let's hope it will serve as a, as a real lesson for improving that uh, preparedness for the future. Staggering figures, <coughs> staggering figures. Right over here. Good evening, my name is Priya Agrawal, um, physician, public health professional and social entrepreneur. Um, thank you very much for this collaborative event. It's great to see both deans here. Um, I did my MPH here five years ago and spent most of my time running around campus to Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School to gain the other skills that I felt I needed. And I was wondering what, specifically to the two deans, what your next steps are to answer some of Professor Goldie's challenges. Um, are there any thoughts on creating a combined MPH MBA program, ideally MPH MBA MPP, some creative solutions that would show Harvard making the first visible step and ensuring that health professionals were better equipped to actually make change in the field. As moderator, I turn the question over to Julio. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, the, I think uh, President Faust has been very keen in exactly realizing in a, in, or, you know, reducing the barriers to this interfaculty collaboration. I mean, the great resource of this university is exactly its diversity and, and its strength of its various schools. Yet very often we find that it's difficult to, to achieve and for a student it can all, very often be challenging to be running around and trying to get the most out of, a, of, of their time here. Um, that's why President Faust established the Harvard Institute for Global Health the faculty director of which is Professor Goldie. Uh, it's exactly to provide a mechanism to facilitate the interaction around what's one of the crucial emerging topics of our time, which is health. Exactly because of the legacy of Dr. Brundtland at WHO and the sort of example that Minister Story places when a foreign minister is talking about health and promoting that. Well, the same thing happens here. I come here to the Kennedy School. I have an appointment here. I'm a, I'm a physician. Why am I here? Because there's enormous interest for people who are trying to understand diplomacy of health as a diplomat. So people who are interested in economic development, health is a central dimension of that. You go to the business school, you know, health is the largest sector of the largest economy in the world, the American economy. But it's 10% of the global economy, five and a half trillion dollars is what the health industry represents for the global economy. You cannot be a business person in this world today if you don't understand health fundamentally. You go to the law school where, where Jonah Story started uh, his own academic careers. 
Well, you know, this is an arena where fundamental aspects of international law, like intellectual property rights, get played out. And, 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 and this is a fundamental arena where the debates on human rights actually uh, are, are become material and concrete. And, and so forth, you go to the design school, and design is now centrally involved ab about this. You go to the divinity school, which we have here, and this is a fundamental part of practical religion because of faith-based organization. There's also a spiritual dimension to health. Every, of course, the education school, I mean, the, the links between health and education. Health can be a focal point to bring them together, and that's exactly why uh, the Harvard Institute for Global Health has been established to facilitate that, uh, that uh, synergy to explore joint uh, courses. It's not just at the graduate level, there's now a, a, a real hunger from undergraduates for, mo for many more courses. So hopefully this will be easier for future generations of students. I would just add that first, I actually believe every interesting problem, not just health, crosses these boundaries of, of of business governance, civil society, geographic boundaries, intellectual boundaries, and so I think uh, the, the problems we face globally are all critical. But also just an example of a concrete thing, I mean last January um, we taught a course with, Julio was a, a member of the faculty, I was a member of the faculty, and we had people from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the like, all about long-term issues, acting in time problems, and one of which was a set of issues around uh, comparing pandemics to uh, maternal mortality uh, that, that Julio uh, led wisely. So I think there are various ways uh, to, to do better and whether we want to eventually have a, a genuinely joint degree. A three-way joint degree boggles the mind for me, um, not the least of which is it will take you uh, 16 years to complete. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, I think there's just so many different ways in which we can collaborate on courses and everything else. So right over here. Oh, Sue. I was just going to add um, two things. One is that I think there's a broad spectrum of how to get what you articulated, part of which might be joint degrees, but also might be enhancing curriculum that just uh, shift to have a broader view in and of themselves. And I think we have an obligation to do that regardless of particular interests in health. So there's a broad body of students, some interested in health and some not, but all should have a global outlook. All should be versed in why and how health is important. The second thing I want to mention is in case you're wondering, well, what has that institute done? I want to just go on the record of saying nothing yet. Um, that's not true, really. Uh, the initiative component of this did a lot of things, and it's not for now to talk about it. But what I'd like to say is over the next year, there'll be a really concerted effort to identify within this very decentralized institution, which is not easy to navigate, how exactly we can provide the few high value uh, initiatives that will really change the scope and, and, uh, of, of what we're doing. So I'll just kind of end with that, but wanted to yeah. Great. point it out. Right over here. Um, my name is Hege Finholt, and I'm doing a PhD in philosophy at Boston University. And I have one question. Given that the um, bottled water industry has so much power uh, preventing people from access to clean water, I wonder who can do anything about this and what can they do? Thank you. Water industry, bottled water. <laughs> Um, well, let me uh, just uh, say, I mean, there's, it, it is a specific, um, uh, a very specific question, um, and there is, it, this is a complex topic, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know, and water is, of course, a, a, a major uh, topic. It actually links very nicely to the previous question, because here at Harvard, we do have a Harvard Water Initiative that's actually looking at water from all of this perspective, from an engineering perspective, from a public health perspective. The, the Kennedy School, of course, is a major part of that, a policy perspective. Um, a, you know, I, I don't want to enter into the merits or, or not of, of bottled water itself, but, but it is a, an illustration of also what Minister Story mentioned. I mean, a, a lot of these issues we deal with are now uh, interfacing with large sectors of, of activity. Bottled water is one, but there are, there are many. Of, of economic activity, 
And when policy gets formulated, we need to look at the, at the best evidence about that and, and take a, a holistic view. I, I think uh, uh, it just illustrates that, that there are those uh, connections with a variety of industries that have a direct effect on, 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 on water and why we need uh, the power of evidence to uh, guide policy. Can I, can I, oh, did you want to? No, I mean, uh, the, the question was about, you know, the role of, of bottled water industry in, in, in that, well, I, it, it's a bit beyond what I can feel I can answer in, in detail, but I, I think that, again, I mean, water is going to be the new oil issue. And it's not going to be, it is already. And although we will have in, 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 in my country and your country, because it's the same country, we're going to have a lot of water and more water. We will be on the beneficial side of it. Uh, I, together with Secretary Clinton tomorrow, I will be discussing about how do we deal with water in Gaza and how does Israel deal with the drought. This is just, you know, a precursor of what we're running into. So, again, I think a major theme, which no single discipline will deal with alone, it goes into the deep science of how we continue to do desalination more effectively. How do we fund it? How do we move forward uh, quantitatively uh, in, 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 in dealing with it? How do we deal with the health consequences? And how do we deal with water refugees? I'm going to take my prerogative and ask uh, a quick question to the panel. You mentioned several times, Minister, the, the Millennium Del Development Goals. And um, I have two questions. One is, has that been, in fact, an important galvanizing force? Because actually, from my point of view, health has done way better than almost every other international global issue. You sort of think about, I was in Vietnam recently, they killed you know, thousands, maybe millions of chickens to avoid avian flu. That's, that's, you think about Mexico's remarkable achievements with the H1N1, a really uh, a, a, a public health, uh, I mean, a, a, a public good for the world. So had the Millennium Development Goals, were they instrumental in that? And then I guess the second part is, they're about to be, we're going to reach the end of that in four years. Are there really important lessons from this first round in help us to think about the second round? So. I think we have to start with the analysis of acknowledging that nothing here is perfect. And if we're going to kill the experience of the MDGs by saying that they were not all completed in time, uh, then we're out of business of the real world. The attempt of the MDGs was to say, let's focus based on evidence, based on knowledge, what it will take to half absolute poverty 20, 2000 to 2015. I mean, uh, a very daring undertaking, knowing that we, we didn't know what those 15 years would bring. I think the fact that the MDGs are still around as targets in 2010 is a major achievement. You could have imagined that, you know, halfway you would have simply have, you know, watered out. But it was a real uh, effort at this General Assembly to do a kind of two-thirds evaluation. And I think that uh, uh, there are country-specific plans where you can measure how progress is doing. Uh, we have now uh, focused massively on maternal mortality as the most disgraceful part of those MDGs not demonstrating progress. And the fact that it is there among the eight targets, and we have 2015, has helped mobilize governments and professions to say, you know, we simply have to act because time is running out. We're doing not bad on child mortality, we're doing a, a better on, 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 on some of the education targets, but on this one, it is a disgrace. So it has a mobilizing potential. And I think this comes to the point that Julio mentioned. There has been a massive mobilization, but with every mobilization, you, you create disorder. So the question now is, can you turn this disorder into something which is creative and creating new targets beyond 2015? Can we, in time for 2015, look towards 2020, 2030, with something which is meaningful, bridging, moving forward. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is moving into another faculty, namely the PR fac faculty. How do you g g grasp the imagination of people that these things are important? Again, I come back to the very troublesome point about all our initiatives, that it really blew the UN. And it has caused me a lot of reflection. The WHO, our dear institution, has in its constitution that the World Health Organization is the lead agency in health. And I remember when we came to WHO, Dr. Brundtland made a point of saying that, that that is not something that is given. You have to earn it. You cannot turn 
uh, to the World Bank and to the pharmaceuticals and say that don't do this because we are the lead agency in health. If you don't earn that leadership, forget it. You have to demonstrate that you are moving forward and you earn it. And the only way WHO can earn that normative function now is that it adopts to that new world setting where we have the gates and the others who engage, and that is good, but it creates, you know, complication. Obviously, in Seattle, there is another normative function growing out. Yeah. And how can we make sense of that in the global health architecture in a way that can, again, mobilize new initiatives? That, I think, is full of opportunity, but full of also institutional challenges as we move towards 2015. Well, just very quickly to say, um, you know, there, I, I, I'm a member of, uh, of a group that was convened by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called the, the um, advocates for the MDGs, so I, I need to, to say something uh, in that respect as, as an advocate of the MDGs. But we had our meeting in September around the, the, um, the uh, General Assembly, um, and one of the points that came out is that probably the biggest contribution of the MDGs has been to the question of accountability. It, this, I think, is the first time where every country in the world actually committed themselves to quantitative targets. And although they've been criticized, being reductionist and what, whatever, but the main contribution was it created a framework for accountability where countries now can monitor how are they on trajectory for meeting MDGs, uh, which MDGs, you know, most as you know, as was saying, MDG 5 is the one we're lagging the most. Why is that? I mean, it created, an, uh, for you know, my three paradoxes, the accountability paradox, I think has been greatly served by the MDGs. So I do hope, and there's already a lot of discussion on what to do after 2015. Part of that is to reflect, when it comes to health, the new emerging agenda, particularly the chronic diseases. And there's already a high-level session of the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, not the World Health Assembly, next September, to deal with this question of, of the chronic diseases. I think it's in preparing, but I do hope that this framework of accountability will be preserved into, into the future. Right up here. Hi, um, I'm, uh, my name is Divya Seth and I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I had a question concerning pharmaceuticals. So one of the uh, biggest blocks to healthcare is access to medicine. And a lot of drugs are still locked up in the national patents of various countries. So how do you, um, address the issue of access to health care while taking national sovereignty and the patent laws into consideration? <laughs> Can somebody help me? Well, um, uh, it's an absolutely key issue. I touched upon it, you know, from the market failure point of view. I mean, this is always, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the pharmaceutical industry or medical profession, but I acknowledge the dilemma. How do you create incentives for research? And in turn, you will have ability to get return on your investment because you have something to sell. Versus the obvious crisis of public health out there of poor people and generics and access to these drugs. There is slow progress, but still progress in the world trade regulations on this. It's different now than 10 and 20 years ago. So there is progress on that, on, on, on that uh, uh, road. But I think, you know, what this, again, flurry of initiatives over the last 10 years has done, and following up on Julio's accountability, is that this is everybody's business. Uh, and that, you know, saying that 500 million without access to a specific drug is something which is simply because there's no market is no longer acceptable. And it's being brought onto the arenas of WTO and the rest. Uh, uh, and, and, and that agenda has to be driven. But we have to acknowledge that there are dilemmas here in, 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 in what it takes to run that, uh, that industry. But let me open another chapter, which was partly why I took this initiative of health and foreign policy and to bring together these specific countries. I remember, and I mentioned this to some other students earlier today, an article by Richard Holbrook a couple of years ago where he accused Indonesia for not releasing a virus which would go to the pharmaceutical industry and could produce the drugs to combat that virus, because obviously that was a global threat. Now, why didn't Indonesia do that? Because Indonesia had learned that this is a natural resource. And it, it sits on a virus which can be extremely valuable for an industry. 
And who would give away that raw material without any power, uh, you know, uh, sharing uh, of, of, uh, of, of opportunities? I think that simply exempl uh, exemplifies what we are into uh, on a global scale for this industry, uh, for, the, for, for the whole perspective of, of, of biomedicine and, and, and access to, uh, to, to, to resources, which will require some hard bargaining at WTO in Geneva around these issues, and where countries such as Norway and Brazil and Indonesia normally would sit in different camps, but we can no longer do that. So obviously there should be a mechanism by which Indonesia would share that virus so that you can have start the process of producing the drugs and the vaccine and whatever, but you cannot do it unless there is a sharing mechanism which also governments have to take part in creating. I'm afraid we have time for just two more questions. <clears throat> right here. Hi, my name is uh, Frederick Delman. I'm a student at the Business School. Um, it sounds like addressing these uh, health issues would involve overcoming market failures and in investing in public goods. Um, but these are characteristics that would uh, lead me to believe that the private sector wouldn't want to uh, do such things. What can be done to further mobilize more private capital into the health space? Well, I mean, uh, 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 private capital is there. Uh, it, it is, you know, as I said, uh, the largest sector of the largest economy, 17% of the U.S. economy, um, you know, about $2.5 trillion. And uh, most of that is private financing. Uh, and globally, it is a huge part of the global economy. I mean, this, this $5.5 trillion. Uh, the private sector has a very major role, but it is not an issue of, of either or. I think it, it is the responsibility of, I mean, I, I, I would apply the same logic of what I said for the global health system. We, we use it for the national health system. It's what are the functions that are carried out. And a, and a health system has to carry four fundamental functions. This was the work we did in WHO. The stewardship function is setting rules of the game. That's a quintessential public function. Financing so that fin f f uh, lack of money is not a barrier to access to, to, to care. That again, the public sector has a fundamental role either in financing health or mandating uh, coverage for everyone. <clears throat> but then when it comes to the provision of care, that's where you get a lot of uh, space for innovations in, 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 in private participation. And then the fourth function, which is to generate the resources like pharmaceuticals and others, that's another sphere for, for, for substantial uh, private investment. So the question is not a public versus private. It's how do you get that mix right? And well-performing health systems will achieve that mix by making sure that there's a framework that uh, sets fair rules of the game that protects consumers also because this is a market with huge information asymmetries. So you have the right regulatory framework that assures that money is not an obstacle and therefore correct some fundamental market failures, say in the insurance market, but at the same time, you know, creates enormous spaces for the sort of innovation that private uh, investment can, can generate. Okay, I realized I, I uh, missed you up here before, so I'm gonna ask <coughs> you both to give short questions and well, one answers to the whole thing. So very quickly, thank, thank you. you. My name is Mona Moafi. I completed my doctorate in social epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health about a year ago. Uh, I also have a background in Middle East studies, and when I look at uh, the current administration's plan uh, around global health uh, and de uh, development uh, and development, um, and I think about commitments such as the multi-billion dollar commitment to Pakistan um, towards development uh, from the State Department as a foreign policy goal, but also I'm sure some of that will go towards health. I, I wonder to myself, um, in the discussion of evidence base, and I'm in, in particular interested to hear from both the minister of uh, foreign minister and the health minister, uh, former health minister, um, how these decisions are being made internally, and where you're seeking evidence at the current, uh, sort of in the past few years, since this is such a new field. Thank you. And this will be the last question. Uh, I think this is a similar related question to Pakistan. I'm a cardiologist here at Massachusetts General Hospital. And um, we do a lot of uh, non-communicable disease research work in Pakistan. And uh, this Kerry Lugo bill has offered about $10, $10 billion worth over the next five to 10 years in all sorts of different things. 
And you may not have the, 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 the specific answer for this, but maybe how would you think about uh, when you approach the government of the United States as to how do you direct some of this money to be spent towards, say, healthcare restructuring or health system reform, or how do you think about these issues? And maybe if you could sort of guide us uh, in, in, in talking about this. Okay, two related questions. We'll just go down the line. Well, hard ones. And if you look at the way we spend money, which are foreign policy initiated, they would deviate from um, another analysis of what is most needed to create healthy populations. The cost of wars. I mean, all these different uh, examples of what, would, what, what difference would it have made if we spent that mon money differently. So I think it boils down to this. States are still the prime actors in this international system, as we know. States have interests. And it, it is, in a way, depressingly similar to what it has been uh, for centuries. Uh, the troublesome part now is that what Julio was asking for, a kind of a global me mechanism that could help kind of translate that interdependence into decisions that were informed from a global perspective, we are living in hard times from that now, right now for a variety of reasons. Uh, so you will see, I think, money that go to Pakistan under these circumstances that should go with much stronger messages in other domains. I mean, not to enter into a Pakistani discussion here now, but you know, I think one obvious part of that equation should be Pakistan's own taxation system. Is Pakistan really mobilizing resources of its own population? But that's a separate question. And, 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 and it's a separate debate, but also in a way linked. But we, we could have debated that as a, a special topic. How do we uh, um, aid a country such as Pakistan? The point here, however, is that if you engage in foreign aid, it should be in the way that the aid is going to purposes which, based on evidence, work. And I think what we started to do with the health uh, evidence for, uh, for policy uh, cluster in WHO back at Julio's times, the, the, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, was to provide evidence so that when you engaged in global health as a government, as a donor, as official, official development aid, you would follow those track and not any track. Now take Afghanistan, for example, where I think one of the biggest challenges at the moment, in addition to the insurgency and the war, is how we do civil aid. Because the military inside NATO are pretty good at coordinating the way they do their military affairs. But we are hopeless at the way we coordinate our civilian affairs. Now, if we're going to build Afghan capacity or Pakistani capacity, we have to do it through the Afghans and through the Pakistanis. And in Mozambique, through the Mozambique institutions. But donors really do. Because they want their flag and their print and their own people to do it. So we don't build capacity. So I think we have, what we have to do from the evidence side is to demonstrate, and we have 50 years of development uh, cooperation to, to, to learn from success and failure stories, is that if you don't build capacity, if you don't invest where the needs are, not needs defined here in this capital or my capital, but defined in the country where you try to engage, and so on and so forth, that aid is not going to make, it, make, make a difference. And the troublesome part when you go to Afghanistan, for example, where we all need to be focused, is that only 10 to 15 percent of the aid passes through Afghan channels for good reasons, because there is corruption and mismanagement. But unless we engage the local capacity, we're not going to leave a capacity that can continue to, to do the business. Sir? I'm going to pass to you. <coughs> Well, I mean, uh, uh, on this particular question, or yeah. more or less, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't have anything to, to add. I think the, the question of, uh, of, of local capacity is very important. But uh, Jonas's comment just illustrates how, along with particular um, efforts to mobilize aid of any, any sort, you have to, uh, to add this sort of knowledge related global public goods. This is a fundamental part of what we produce. It's the evidence that can then empower local decision makers to make the right allocation decisions. And you, know, you were asking, how, how does it work? 
I mean, you know, in, in, in Mexico, we were trying to do a, a health reform. The first thing we went for were some of these knowledge-related global public goods. For example, the methodology to measure national health accounts and reveal a fundamental issue of, of you know, half of the population, 50 million people being uninsured and experiencing catastrophic expenditures. We actually used the work that had been done at WHO of ranking health system performance to make the case for reform. And it, it's a very nice way of when things work well, how you establish this virtuous dialectic, this virtuous dialogue between global public goods that then are applied to national uh, problems, to local problems, to address a local, pro uh, a, a local issue. And, and this is when you know, the, 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 the global system works at its best. And this is why we need to protect that part of the global architecture, which is the production of evidence and other knowledge-related uh, global public, because they can really empower national decision makers to uh, take, make the right decisions. <clears throat> Mr. I'm gonna give you the last word. And just, you know, I think that uh, uh, the way these programs are gonna work in the future, there's gonna be a much bigger emphasis on accountability and performance-based disbursements. And that, I think, goes in the whole issue of transfer of these financial resources. You need to see that on the other side. On MDG5, on maternal mortality, we are doing now projects which I think are extremely promising in Pakistan and in India, by the way, uh, with at the local state level, which is very simple in the sense that a small financial incentive to the mother is empowering her to seek the services she needs to avoid disgraceful death at delivery. Uh, and we are, we are tracking the, the results of this and can measure how it makes a difference. And now we need a system that those examples can be brought in and kind of dispersed to other uh, uh, models. On Gavi, on immunization, we can measure how the number of vaccines and immunization dispersed according to government plans in the country concerned yields a difference. And I will take that all the way to a completely different sphere where Norway is heavily engaged, which is on rainforest preservation, where we are developing the red plus with Brazil, which is basically going to shift the logic to create the value of a tree which is not taken down, uh, that it has value standing and not being logged. How do we do that? Not by paying upfront money that we know will disappear into you know, uh, corruption and the likewise, but it's going to be performance-based disbursement. That can be done through new technology of satellites that can monitor uh, the, the, the state and, and uh, integrity of forests, and you have disbursements coming out as a, as a consequence of, uh, 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 of having um, applied the rules. These mechanisms have been developed because disciplines have cooperated. It, it has taken the finest art of uh, uh, economics, micro and macro. It has taken, in the, in the case of forest, you know, a full mobilization of forestry experts. And now we are into the phase of building the institutions that can monitor and secure transparency and, and accountability. But the biggest danger now, of course, is that I believe as we move into this financial crisis, we're only going to see the beginning of budgets going down. And the paradox is that, you know, as we are reaching some very fine goals on the NDGs, on uh, OECD countries striving towards 0.7 uh, in ODA, which they have committed to, they are climbing in the 0.2 towards 0.3, and now it's starting to reverse. That, I think, uh, we're going to see in many of these key ODA providers who are now struggling with deficits and debts. And that's going to be a hard call. <coughs> All right, well, thank you very, very much. And Julio Frank, Sue Goldie, and especially uh, Foreign Minister Jonas Torre. Thank you very much. Appreciate your being here.